this morning. Help us to better understand the mystery of your providence, your grace, and the lives of people down through the centuries. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. What I want to uh, get up to today <coughs> is the uh, beginning of the Middle Ages. I want to get up to the 13th uh, century. Let me just uh, capsulize briefly where he, we have been. We began by talking about the two great surprises of the early Christians. The first, that uh, the Jews didn't come into the church. And one of the readings of today's liturgy talks about Paul in Antioch and Pisidia and how the Jews rejected it. And so they turned to the Gentiles and it said how joyful the Gentiles were. It was part of the whole turning to the Gentile world. And then the fact that history continued was the other great surprise for the early Christians. And they responded with the importance of tradition, of handing on the, the spoken message, and uh, then with the creation of, of an instituted uh, authority in the church that was not simply a charismatic. We talked about the rivals Christianity faced, the government, the persecution, the cults, uh, the heresies, the philosophies, all of which vied for loyalty. Then how the church was tolerated in 313, the Edict of Milan, and the immense number of people who entered the church when it was tolerated. And then uh, last week we talked about two of the major heresies the first one, Arianism, which denied the divinity of Christ and took more than half of all of Christianity into itself. And how that was addressed at the Ecumenical Council of Nicaea. And then Nestorianism, which denied the humanity of Christ. And that was addressed at the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus. And we talked a little bit about the rise of monasticism. Remember we talked about John the Baptist and how he was ascetical, and there was that ascetical uh, tradition in Christianity, and the age of martyrs uh, began the age of moral heroes, of hermits, and that led to monasticism. Then we talked about the decline of the Roman Empire, with which Christianity was already pretty much identified, with so many uh, Roman citizens in the empire. Now, we even uh, mentioned St. Patrick and how St. Patrick organized the church, not in terms of uh, bishop and diocesan priest, but in terms of abbot and monk, and how that began a long chain of events in which the priesthood in the Catholic Church became more and more monastic, which is the model that it still has. And we can talk more about that. Now what I want to talk about is how the church survived the fall of the Roman Empire. One of the great problems in teaching history is that we look back at people back there, centuries back, and we say, Gee, what was wrong with those people? <laughs> um, how come they didn't do this? How come they didn't do that? How come they didn't do what I would do or feel what I felt? It's so hard to realize how our feelings are a product of a long historical development, and how other people felt very different kinds of ways. So in teaching history, the, one of the challenges is always to get people back into the mind frame that people were in at that particular time. Now, what happened when the Roman Empire collapsed? The Roman Empire was the the great source of law and order in society for hundreds and hundreds of years, centuries, close to a millennia. So that's what people look to for structure. And when that fell, something fell which they thought would endure forever. It would be the same as if the Chinese communists took over America. Can you imagine the Chinese communists taking over our country? We can't imagine that. They could not imagine the barbarians taking over the Roman Empire. Different people 
uh, different language, different kind of history, different laws, different religion, and conquerors. Well, that, that's, uh, that's a mind-boggling kind of thing. Imagine us trying to live under uh, Chinese dictators. It's roughly the same sort of tremendous leap. Uh, in 378 A.D., the Goths defeated the Emperor Valens. In the 5th century, the Visigoths, these were Germanic tribes, they, they conquered Spain. And they drove the Vandals out of Spain into North Africa. And the Vandals wreaked a tremendous havoc on the civilizations of North Africa, which were Christian civilizations. And what word comes from the havoc that they wreaked in North Africa? They were vandals. Vandals. Vandalism. That, that's a fourth century term. It talks about how devastating these people were, except there wasn't one or two kids. It was armies of people on the move. The Ostrogoths took over Hungary. The Anglo-Saxons moved into Britain. So all these people were on the move, pagans. And as we saw last week, some of them were Christians of an Aryan variety, Christians who denied the divinity of Christ. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is three stages going from the chaos, the lack of law and order, the might makes right, the disillusion of society, when the Roman Empire fell, to up to the 13th century, when they sort of got their act together again, and what we call the Middle Ages started. And there were three giant steps going from chaos to a European uh, civilization in which the church was the kind of mother of that civilization. The first comes in the, uh, the fifth and sixth centuries. The people who were in control were Franks. They were a German tribe. You know, Franco-American spaghetti is French-American. Franco, that comes from the Franks. They were part of the ancestors of um, what we call France today. They uh, and they took over, they were in charge. And the Christian bishops of the area who were struggling with, with the church, which was mostly in the cities, the Franks in the countryside, but kind of dominant, they were saying, well, what can we do? We're faced here with two Germanic groups, one that's Aryan and the other one that's pagan. The Aryans do not want to convert to Catholic Christianity at this point. Okay, thank you, sweetheart. The Aryans don't want to convert at this point. So the bishop said, maybe what we should do is appeal directly to the Frankish tribe to accept Catholic Christianity. And uh, so a, 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 an archbishop of Reims, his name was Remigius, uh, converted <laughs> the king. And his name, uh, we refer to him now as Clovis. In 486, Clovis had defeated a Roman army. So he was a powerful person. In 496, he was baptized along with thousands of his troops at Reims on Christmas Day. And therefore, the city dwellers who were Catholic Christians, and now Clovis, who was head of the, of the conquering army, the, the Franks, they were both Christian. And so they started to intermarry. They had good association with each other, friendly relations. And from that day, historians do no longer talk about Gaul. They talk about France. You see, 
when the Franks started intermarrying with the indigenous Christian population, what evolved was the nation that we call France today. It would take centuries to evolve, but they consider that to be the birthday of that nation. Christmas 496 at Reims. Now we might say, Clovis and thousands of his troops, what do you mean thousands of his troops? We're going to see that pattern over and over again as, as, as barbarians enter the church. That the big historical events were not so much one person thoughtfully thinking it out, going through a catechumenate, deciding, studying it as an adult, and then entering the church. The big events in history were mass conversions. If the leader became a Christian, the followers automatically became Christians, pretty much. Uh, so when Clovis, the Frank king, became Christian, thousands of his troops were baptized that Christmas day and immediately following. Now you might say, what a strange way to approach life. How do we understand the mentality of something like that? Well, you know, going back to this country, you know what's outlawed in this country today? You know what you can't legally be a member of in America? It's the Communist Party. Okay. If you're a member of the Communist Party in America, you are automatically, I don't even question it, considered to be subversive and opposed to some of our fundamental values like democracy, because they're totalitarianism, totalitarian, like free enterprise, because they have controlled economy, like faith in God, because they are, uh, the state is atheistic. So, so a communist is a, is a considerable threat to what we stand for. We don't allow that party to exist in this country. Well, they had that same mentality, you see, in the area of religion. If, if you were a different religion than the ruler, the king, then the king and all of those faithful to him immediately considered you to be a subversive. You had different values, different loyalties, uh, a different approach to life, a different kind of faith. And that, that to them was like, what, like we would treat an American communist. That was just not within their framework to tolerate that. So that's why they were mass conversions, because they felt that the unity of the people depended upon adherence to one faith. Just like we say, in this country, you have to be in favor of democracy or there it was a particular religion. So, it was a great event when Clovis uh, became a, uh, a Catholic. And then, with the church's blessing, he went on and incorporated into his kingdom other areas which today are part of France. Burgundy wine is named after the Burgundians who became part of, part of that kingdom with uh, Clovis uh, and Provence in France was also incorporated in that kingdom. So that by the end of the sixth century, much of what later became France was Catholic Christian, the only alternative being Aryan Christian or pagan. And. Uh, when you say that they were Catholic, what does that mean? Well, if you were part of thousands of people coming in, probably it meant that your faith was kind of superficial, that you didn't understand it well. Uh, there were no books to read. Priests themselves sometimes couldn't read, or especially in your language. I mean, we're used to literacy and books. Well, take away the ability to read, even from leaders and priests, <laughs> religious people like that, take away scriptures in our language, take, take all, all that away, and what do you have? You have the basis for uh, 
a not very uh, sophisticated approach to religion, plus come in by the thousands. See the problem the fa church would face for centuries afterwards. How do we make these people who have come into the church understand faith and make their commitment to Jesus Christ? Because what, what they brought in with them was a lot of their former pagan religious influence. Um, well, the Frankish kingdom went into a kind of a decline. And uh, they, they stayed around and, and they reemerged. But that, that, that kingdom did not have a whole lot of vitality afterwards in the seventh century. And it became clear uh, to the church that that kingdom was not going to play the role the church had hoped in, in creating order in a, a society where people could be safe to live in, where there was justice. Uh, and so the second stage in the, the, uh, the Christianization of, of Europe came with uh, Pope St. Gregory the Great, who, who was pope from the year 590 to 604. He was born into a wealthy Roman family well-educated for his time, and prepared for a career uh, with a secular government. Because there were places, cities, where there, there, there were still governments, and, and he was prepared for that kind of a career. Well, his parents died. And he turned their estate into a monastery. And he vowed to dedicate himself to living as a monk. Uh, but he was a Roman, living around Rome, and people had deep respect for Gregory. So the Pope often called him up, and uh, not on a phone, but just called him up to, the, to, uh, to Rome to consult with him on religious matters and civil matters. So he became a, a, a reluctant consulter to the Pope. And then when that Pope died, Gregory was everyone's choice to be pope, and so he was made pope very reluctantly, uh, but he made a great pope. When he became pope, you have to say, you have to remember, there were no big civil, civil governments in Italy. So when he became pope, he was unofficially, but in fact, the protector of Italy, especially central Italy and kind of the spiritual father of the Christian church in the West. And that was a very important role, the protector of, of Italy. And that role develops in history. It helped the people at the time, but as it became institutionalized, uh, it created other problems with church and state. Anyways, Gregory saw that the future uh, for peace, the future for Christian faith did not rely upon protecting ourselves from pagan invaders, but on embracing them, converting them to Christ, and then building a new world in partnership with them. He is a very, very far-seeing man. And so one of the things he did is he sent St. Augustine to England which, even in Gregory's lifetime, yielded tremendous fruit that I'll talk about. A, a person whom we call now St. Augustine of Canterbury. He was sent by the Pope to England um, in the sixth century. Uh, and uh, then he, uh, Gregory also converted the royal house of the Western Gothic Kingdom in Spain. Well, those people were the ancestors of, of what later emerged as Spain. And they were brought into the church by the pope, and they always maintained, even in the Middle Ages, a very strong loyalty to the pope. And uh, he brought in the Lombards. You've heard of Lombardy? It's part of Italy, part of northern Italy. Well, those people he brought into the church uh, but once again, they were rather superficial in their faith, and they caused a lot of problems in Italy for a long time to come. But they were superficially uh, Catholic Christians. 
What does that mean superficially? It means the vast majority of people, they accepted that. That was part of their loyalty. It's kind of like there are all kinds of people in our society who don't understand democracy very well, but who believe in it. You know? They couldn't tell you about its philosophical roots. They couldn't tell you about the great documents of democracy, but they know that, that they believe in democracy. Well, that's kind of how they believed in, in, in Catholic Christianity. Uh, easily understood if you put yourself in their position. Um, uh, some of the other things Pope St. Gregory did was he um, worked for the reform of the clergy. Mostly that meant educating them. Education. I mean, how could you read the scriptures unless you could read? It's a constant struggle to teach people to read, to teach them enough of the, of the Gospels so they could commit their lives to Christ. A constant struggle to keep the clergy from, from getting married. Because where? They were isolated in, in a world in chaos, not well educated. So they did the natural thing. A lot of those people got married and they still stayed in the ministry. Now, the closer you were to a city, the less that would be tolerated. But there was a lot of that. Just like in South America today, there's, mo there's more of that. Uh, we wouldn't tolerate any of it in this country. In South America, some of that just gets tolerated because, because they're remote. Another, uh, uh, another thing that Pope St. Gregory did was he wrote a life of St. Benedict. And that was very popular devotional reading amongst those who could read. And that <coughs> helped spread St. Benedict's rule because St. Benedict, in the fifth century, wrote a monastic rule uh, for a civilized, educational, monastic life, which has remained the pattern of monastic life for a thousand years. I mean, that is the same rule that the monks at St. Anselm's in Washington, D.C., who run St. Anselm's Academy, follow today. And St. Benedict, I mean, Saint Pope St. Gregory promoted what St. Benedict started in that way. Well, St. Augustine of Canterbury was extremely successful uh, bringing the Anglo-Saxons into the church. And this is one of the two main streams that later on would create England. And in the year 597, he baptized the Anglo-Catholic, Anglo-Saxon Anglo king, whose name was Ethelbert. And once again, uh, when Ethelbert came in, 10,000 warriors came in with him. Um, and uh, Augustine brought in the king, and then uh, Celtic monks worked with their former enemies and tried to teach them Christianity. By the year 690, virtually all of what we call England today was Christian, uh, Catholic, not Aryan. Now, when you consider that those people all these mass conversions, you know, there were some people faithful to their paganism. So sometimes they were brutally converted. Um, just how we would, as I said, treat communists, put them into prison and all that stuff. They had their counterparts to that. So the Anglo-Saxons came into the church. But within a century, some of them were so rooted in their new faith, so devout, that they went as missionaries uh, to the continent. And uh, they founded monasteries and uh, began to, to work to convert more and more of Europe to the church. There were two things that they did, the Anglo-Saxon monks, but for some reason the Celtic monks didn't do, which made their work much more permanent and enduring. First of all, the Anglo-Saxon monks always sought to get along with whoever was the authority in the area, which the Celtic monks didn't much worry with because the authorities were hostile to them. 
But the Anglo-Saxon monks, they wanted to be at peace with whoever the authority was. And they maintained very close links to the papacy because that was the protection against being controlled by whatever authority they were fun functioning under. It's always been true in the church that the real choice that, uh, that is faced is between control by the state or, or um, influence and, and direction from the papacy. That was the choice that they had uh, in those days. They always stayed very close to the papacy. One of the most successful Anglo-Saxon monks was Saint Boniface. He was born in the year 672, and uh, he went to Charles Martel, who was the king of the, of the Franks and a Christian, and asked if he could work among the Franks. Charles Martel said yes. Then he went to the Pope and asked if he could lead his monks in to work with the Franks, and the Pope said yes and made him a bishop. And uh, he was very successful. And so he was consecrated the bishop in Rome in 722. In 732, he went back to the pope and said, you know what, that church over there, some of them have been Christians since Clovis, but they, they were superficially converted. They don't know the faith well. The church needs a lot of reforming. So the pope created him an archbishop and sent him back. And he did a lot of work uh, helping the faith to sink in to the hearts of his people. And in 754, he was uh, murdered by some pagans uh, from a tribe uh, called Frisians. And so he and his companions were, were just slaughtered by them. Nevertheless, you see, that missionary work brought England and much more of what would become France uh, into the church. Uh, and then, came time for the third great initiative in, in uh, spreading the Christian faith in, in Europe. And what was happening at this, at this particular time, which was the seventh century, is that Mohammed started preaching his faith uh, to people in that part of the Mediterranean whom we, we refer to now as uh, Muslims or Islam or Mohammedism. And uh, he was a religious fellow. He went, he visited Jerusalem. He was very impressed by some aspects of uh, Jewish faith. He was impressed by some aspects of the Christian faith, especially of both of those faiths, monotheism, the fact that there was just one God. And he had a religious conversion. He called the one God Allah. It's the name he assigned to God. And he said, there's one God, and I'm his messenger. And so what he looked for was an absolute submission to God, which is at the heart of Islam. It has some other features, too, like the notion of holy war, to spread uh, the um, Islam. And of course, you know, the, that's the name of, of at least one of the terrorist groups uh, now. The Jihad, yeah. Well, it has a religious root. Um, and what the Mohammedans did is they, that really struck them, their temperament, it struck them. Mohammed's vision of heaven was, you know, like you can be a, you can be a prince and it was harems and all this kind of stuff. He, he gave them a very concrete vision of heaven. And they just uh, accepted that. And uh, they did a tremendous amount of conquering. They conquered North Africa, which is not like it was today. North Africa today is, is a Muslim area. Well, then it was a Christian area. It was more like what Europe was at the time. They conquered that. Then they went across the Straits of Gibraltar, and they conquered Spain, and they stayed there for about seven centuries. Um, and they were attacking Constantinople between the years of 674 and 678. Now, that was the capital of the Eastern Empire, the part of the empire that had not fallen when, uh, when the barbarians took over in the West. The part of the empire that one of Charlemagne's sons, not Charlemagne, but uh, 
Constantine's sons had inherited. Uh, and so what happened is the Arabs just kind of took away so much of their empire. The people of Constantinople were wonderful in resisting the Muslim invasion, but it greatly weakened their whole empire, took vast parts of it away. All of Egypt was taken away. Uh, Bethlehem, the Holy Land, uh, North Africa, as I say. So that the Christians in the West, it was, became very clear that they could not look to the Christians in the East for help anymore, because the Christians in the East had more than enough problems of their own. Uh, now, we go back a bit. The Frankish kingdom started to get restored after a couple centuries of decline. One of their kings was Charles Martel. His son's name was Pippin. I'm sure it has nothing to do with the musical. What's the <laughs> Poppin, is it? What's it? Anyways. Uh, his odd name, Pippin. But um, he, he took over. He was the, the king of the Franks. And the Pope appealed to him for help, not against the Arabs, but against the uh, Lombards, those people whom Gregory had converted, superficially converted. They were living in northern Italy. They wanted to take over central Italy, which was particularly under the protection of the Pope. Even though they were Catholic, they, it was just like you know, Germans and French. They were Catholic, too. They fought in World War II. Uh, well, these people were trying to come down and take over. The Pope was trying to protect Italy. He was the only protector they had. So he appealed to Pippin, who, who went down there and beat the Franks. And then he gave the Pope central Italy. And that was the origin of the Papal States, you see. It came from the fact that there was no government there. The pope was the protector. When they were invaded, the pope brought in the army to protect them. That king said, you take care of southern Italy, central Italy. So the papal states uh, uh, came on the scene at that time. Well, the Franks went back home. They rearmed themselves. They got their act together. And uh, I don't mean the Franks, but the Lombards. And they were going to attack central Italy again. And uh, this time, Pippin was dead. His son was Charlemagne, the emperor. The pope went to Charlemagne, got his help. Charlemagne came and definitively defeated the Lombards and reasserted the pope's papal states. That's how the pope became not just a religious leader, which he was already, but the civil ruler of all of central Italy. And uh, it was for the benefit of those people when it came, but it was not good as a long-term development. Because when you have the church and state united that way, there's too much <laughs> unity. There's not, not the criticism, too much power concentrated in too few hands. and. Uh, uh, that's what the Papal States became as time, as centuries went on. I'm talking centuries, they lasted centuries. And um, don't forget, it was only in this century that the Italians settled with the Vatican over the loss of the Papal States. So we're talking about something that endured for a long time. And people believed that the Pope needed his own territory in order to be independent. In the same way, that Catholics today say, well, the Pope should have his own s part of Rome, which we call Vatican City, so that, so that he, ha he has the freedom to, to, for his spiritual role. Well, now it's only part of a city, and, and hardly anyone cares, and it's, it's not, it's not a, a lot of acreage, but it's very important. Well, then it was all of central Italy that was thought of just the way we think of Vatican City today. Now, uh, well, Charlemagne went on, and he did a tremendous amount to unite all of what we call Europe today. And uh, this, the, the faith spread to the Saxons, the Slavs, the Danes. 
And uh, there was a time there of nearly 50 years when Europe was pretty much united under the Emperor Charlemagne. Uh, and so they had allegiance to one faith, uh, one emerging culture, a one political system. Uh, it was kind of like uh, the Roman Empire back again. And uh, Charlemagne was crowned by the Pope as emperor. So they wanted the stability of the Roman Empire back again. And see, for that brief time under Charlemagne, they had it. Uh, and uh, he was a very enlightened and much respected man. In one of my last parishes, there's this cute little blonde, blue-eyed kid, Dutch. He was one of my altar servers. And I met his grandparents one day, and they had this book. And this little, this little altar boy in, 19, in the 1980s was a descendant of of Charlemagne's family, you know, a thousand years back. Imagine that. So that little kid was a thousand years of loyalty uh, to Catholic Christianity, serving Mass for me there. I was always struck by that. Uh, and uh, what happened was that the unity did not last long because Charlemagne's reign got split up among four sons and they started to fight. They fought with their father. They fought with each other. And when they finally made peace, they decided to split it all up. And so it all got split up. You can see why, in the olden days, they, some people left everything to the oldest. <laughs> you know, because, uh, because so much got split up. I mean, if they had just left it in the hands of one person, Charlemagne's oldest son, the history of Western history would have been much more peaceful uh, than it has been. Uh, but with that splitting up, there came weakness. There came uh, uh, poverty into people's lives. And they didn't have the same, the same economy anymore. It was a very bad uh, feature for um, the, the uh, church and the people. Now, what else was going on at this time? Well, Otto the Great, called the Great later on, he was one of the descendants. And he was trying to bring peace, at least within his realm, which included a lot of Germany, and uh, today's Germany. And uh, so what he did was he would put members of his family in charge of different cities or, or groups of cities, only to find that his family <laughs> would turn against him. The power has that way of doing that to people. So they would fight him. They would try to create their own little dynasty in that, in that area of cities. You know? So Otto said, what am I going to do? I want peace around here, I, and I can't trust my own family. So he came across an idea, but for him was brilliant, caused us problems. He said he was going to make the bishops, the archbishops, into princes. Because why? Because they didn't have heirs, at least not legitimate ones. They were amongst the brightest, most educated people of the day. And they were very loyal to the whole idea of law and order in and, and the empire. <coughs> So he made these archbishops into princes, once again up there in Germany, gi giving them what the pope had in the papal states, civil authority and ecclesiastical authority in one man, the prince bishop. Well, it worked well to establish order, but you can imagine, once again, the problems of having your archbishop also be your uh, king. Uh, I have a friend, <coughs> I witnessed his marriage. Um, after his wife died, he met someone else, and, and um, Herman, uh, and, and, th and they went back to Europe last year. And he, and he wanted to go and retrace his roots. Herman wanted to get back in touch with his roots. And so he went, and he went to all these villages, and he went to the house that he was born in, and then, and then his father's house he was born in. And you know what he found out? That he was... Uh, he was one of the subjects of uh, his family, one of the subjects of the prince bishop of one of these 
one of these uh, cities. I forgot which one he told me it was. But he was really uh, kind of thrilled by that. You know, that was his ancestry. I mean, it went back. It went back a long way. It went back to, to this kind of time around the, uh, around the 9th and 10th centuries. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what these prince bishops were. They were the rulers, and, and they owned vast estates, and those people were loyal to them, and it was a mutual thing. Uh, well, just, just to kind of catch up with us uh, here, what was going on in the church? As time went on, uh, this is so important, maybe I should, and I only have a few minutes. The church, we have a phrase for it, the church now, what we've learned from our history, from the experience of living. The church is semper reformanda. Semper means always. Reformanda means to be reformed. The church, someplace, is always in need of reform for the same reason that you and I are not perfect. And when we get together, we're not perfect. The church is always in need of reform someplace. And the beauty of, of Catholic Christianity is the continual rising up within the church of reform movements that bring us face to face with Jesus Christ and what, how he asked us to live. If you look at the history of the church, you will see continual rising up of reform movements. And one of those came through the, like most of them did that age, through the monasteries. In the year 1153, uh, St. Bernard of, Clair of Clairvaux uh, died. Before, that, before his death, he led a tremendous moral uh, reform in the church. He had, when he died, there were 350 reformed Christian monasteries of which he, uh, he was in charge of. St. Bernard's in Riverdale is named after St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, and an, another reform, the people said, these monks are so great and they're so good to work with. All the clergy should be like that. Well, what they did is the cathedral clergy became canons, C-A-N-O-N. And they were a cross between parish priests like myself and monks. And the canons sang the office in the cathedral and, and did those kinds of things. Uh, and that was a reform <coughs> of life as it centered around the cathedrals, which were the main churches of the big cities. And then, uh, uh, I guess I'll have to talk next week about St. Francis of Assisi and St. Dominic and and how they also led reforms of the church, and then how the popes uh, struggled to reform the church. Uh, this is all part of trying to take these people who entered the church by the thousands, get rid of paganism, give them Christian morality, teach them a Christian way of life. And it took centuries, and this is all part of that. I have to talk to you sometime about, about how some of these pagans changed the church that they came into, some of the features they brought in. For example, when my, my father would not go to confession without going to communion. There were a lot of people like that in the church. That went back to the conversion of the Franks, who brought with them from paganism a tremendous emphasis on human sinfulness. And that's the time in the liturgy, around the 8th century, when a lot of things crept, in, crept into the liturgy which were attestations of personal unworthiness. So there was this constant struggle, you know, to Christianize these people. Yes? What you said was so important, I want to make sure I... Do you mean they would not go to communion without going to uh, didn't I say that? Or did I say it the episode? Right around. Right. Got me a little confused, too. <laughs> I said, what? Yeah, that's what I meant. I still know some people like that. Well, I'm, I, I, I'm, not, saying they, I'm not saying that was that was the way they were like. What I'm saying is that they brought into the church this tremendous emphasis on personal sinfulness that later on was expressed in that way. 
But that's part of when they separated the altar from the people, you see. They wanted, the, the altar was the realm of the sacred, so they put a rail around it, and they moved it further and further away from the people, and the people no longer participated. They observed something sacred of which they were unworthy. Those were the kinds of changes that came in with that tremendous struggle to Christianize the people who were the bosses. And, and that's, when we get to the reforms of Vatican II, part of that is, is sh getting rid of a lot of those things that came in. Okay, thank you for your time. Because this is the last covenant session of the year. Of course, we'll be together because we're part of the same tiny community. <laughs> but I feel this sense of loss as I sit here. Um, Mm -hmm. That list that I read this morning doesn't mean anything, May 11th, May 18th. Oh, yes. Let me, let me t uh, and we can talk more about that at the end, but what we're going to do for the next two weeks is we're going to gather in the, in the big room and uh, get summaries from the groups that have been meeting to find out what's been going on in the other groups and also to explain to people what's, what's been going on here in the journey in faith. So... Uh, Ralph and I want to talk about that towards the end. We, we, we want to make about a half-hour presentation. I think there are a good many people interested in the journey in faith next year, and some of you might like to be team members um, this coming year. Uh, if you would like to present, it's going to be a, a team. We're going to put more time into team formation and, and uh, so forth. Um, <coughs> But it, it's a nice opportunity to hear what's been going on in the contemplative group, what has been happening in the Acts of the Apostles group. They're going to put on a little skit on what they've been studying. Um, the uh, building self-esteem in children, the sacraments. So I mean, people are going to just be presenting what, what's been going on in their group. So I'm excited about that. And, and my hope is that people who don't attend Covenant Session will just attend those little summaries and say, gee, you know, I could enjoy being in a group like that. And uh, so that's what we're going to do. One other point is uh, on Ascension Thursday, I know Thursday's in the middle of the week, but on Ascension Thursday, we are having a, um, a priest come down from Annapolis. And... Uh, Letting my enthusiasm carry me away, I said, oh, someone in the community will invite you over for dinner. Now I have to find someone who wants to invite Father over for dinner. He's coming at noon. Uh, he's going to stay at the rectory for the afternoon. He's looking forward to it because they have 12,000 people in his parish, and he's the pastor. And he is just looking forward to that St. Mary's in Annapolis, just looking forward to coming to a place that has 200 families. <laughs> In fact, more than one wanted to come. So he's coming at noon, and uh, then he has a 7 o'clock mass, and I thought it would be nice if someone invited him for dinner. So I have his name and phone number if anyone cares to invite him. Well, let's begin with a prayer, shall we? Lord, we thank you for the blessing that this year has been uh, for our time together. We praise you, Lord, that we're not going to separate, that you have called us to be part of this one small covenant community. We thank you for the people that you make part of our lives. We ask you to send your spirit upon us that we might today better understand your holy church. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name. I think what I have to convey today, um, historically, is a very fundamental understanding of how the Catholic Church reforms herself. And in that, there is a lot of <coughs> what we believe <coughs> as Catholics, what the Catholic Church is. Um, we're going to just go from the 13th century to modern times. So there's one or two details we might skip in this rather panoramic presentation. We left off in the 13th century, and uh, in that century, what we find is the church got very involved with the state. Prince bishops, for example, had had a lot of power. They were lords as well as bishops. 
And you've heard that phrase, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, power does kind of corrupt, and with it comes wealth and prestige and all those things that had little or nothing to do with the ministry of Jesus. So we find in the 13th century that the church leadership, very concerned about wealth, power, their prerogatives, privileges, nice things. And the church needed a reform. And along came a fellow, Francis, from the little town of Assisi in Italy. He was the son of a wealthy merchant who dealt in fabrics. And he was destined to follow his father in his father's business, but he was not interested in being a merchant. He was interested in, in just kind of playing around and having a good time in life. And uh, today we would say he was trying to find himself. And what happened is there was a growing conviction in young Francis, a sense that he should uh, rebuild the church. Like he said, Christ told him to do that. What he did is he went to a little church that was in disrepair in the country, falling apart. And he started to repair the church, the church of San Damiano. That was symbolic of the Catholic Church at the time, in great disrepair. And throughout history, that image of the falling down church of San Damiano has been a, a good image of what the church has been at different times. So Francis began to rebuild it. And after a while, companions came along with him. And Francis <coughs> got more and more religious. There's that famous scene where, where Francis, who had high aesthetic sense, very poetic, natural type of person, was really revolted by lepers. And he was passing a leper colony, a house there. And uh, he was willing to send in money and things like that that we are also willing to do <laughs> the lepers. Um, it was like AIDS today. And after passing it several times, his conscience just got to him. He got off his horse and he went to that house full of today's AIDS victims. And he kissed the first leper that he saw. And then he spent time working with them and cleaning them up and so forth. It was one of the conversions in his life, which just like the San Damiano event, characterize his spirituality. Thomas took poverty very seriously, but without being uptight, and uh, the reform of the church. So being a charismatic figure, which is the mysterious element in, in Francis that can't be put down in a rule, he drew people to himself, and he formed a religious community. In the year 1210, he asked the Pope for permission to establish an order, which is how all orders are established. You can establish it regionally under a bishop, but then if you want to spread around the church, you go to the Pope, and you have your constitutions approved or whatever, and you can become an order. He did that in the year 1210. And in 1221, uh, he gave them a rule. Well, thousands of people were coming to him. And what they did was they practiced poverty. For a living, they begged. And they are called mendicants because of it. It's a word meaning beg. They went around preaching, emphasizing the humanness of Jesus and basic gospel values. The Franciscans, for example, invented the stable. There weren't stables to speak of in churches before uh, St. Francis and the Franciscans, and also Stations of the Cross, emphasizing the humanity of Jesus. It had great impact in reforming the church in his time. Now, when Francis was getting towards the end of his life, 
his own Franciscans realized that the man had virtually no organizational ability. And um, so he had to give up being superior of the order that he founded. And he received for that as a gift from our Lord the stigmata, the wounds of Christ in his hands and in his side. Francis uh, died in 1226, and he had done a tremendous amount because these friars, as they were called, went out and they would preach in villages. And people respected them because of their fundamental gospel values in marked contrast to other parts of the church at the time. And uh, later on, some of these Franciscans became church leaders, and they brought with them a reforming spirit. After Francis died, his followers began to argue about how do you keep the spirit of Francis alive. And uh, they took different routes. And so the Franciscan community has split up over the centuries into different branches, all of them trying to live the gospel in the spirit of St. Francis. Now, there's a lot of lessons in the example of Francis, one of which is that the church has within herself, because of Christ's promise to be with us, the ability to reform as time goes on. The history of the church has been that reformers rise up in the church to call us back to basic Christian values because we're all human and we stray. There are three ways in which the Catholic Church is traditionally reformed. One is by the establishment of religious communities, which is what St. Francis of Assisi did. The other way is by calling church councils, which is what Pope John XXIII did. And the third way is various movements which rise up in the church, as, for example, marriage encounter or charismatic spirituality today. Those are three roots by mechanisms within the Catholic Church by which we regularly get called back to living fundamental Christian uh, values. S scraping away the debris and the junk and getting back to what Jesus was talking about. Um, now, I once worked for a Catholic newspaper, and I had an opportunity to talk with the Superior General of the Franciscans. Now, he was a Brazilian priest. He had two doctorates, and he had something like 28 or 38,000 priests and brothers under him. And I went over to the Franciscan house. I was expecting to meet a potentate, because there's no archbishop who has that many priests under him. And I, I first saw him carrying his dishes into the kitchen like everyone else. Well, that impressed me because he, he really uh, was a very down-to-earth kind of fellow. And then I said to him, now, wouldn't you say that the real followers of St. Francis of Assisi today aren't Franciscans, but little brothers of Jesus, a community founded by Charles de Foucault in the deserts of North Africa and a very poor, poor group of people. Because I was, I was from the press, and I was trying to sort of get under his skin and challenge the man and get a good interview. And he said, look at the little brothers of Jesus three generations from now. And he gave me a lesson on what happens to reform movements in the church. I mean, they do their job, but they're always necessary. He said, Take the Franciscans. St. Francis wanted absolute poverty. Well, suppose a guy comes along, and uh, he's a fine person, but he's very intelligent and scholarly, and he wants some books, you know, and maybe he wants to teach. Well, then the community has a choice. Should we get rid of this guy because he wants to own books and Francis didn't own any? Or should we keep him and kind of adjust? Well, they tend to keep the person and adjust. And the price, the price for that is that they lose some of their fundamental identity as time goes on. Someone might come along and, OK, this guy allows himself some, a couple luxuries that any lay person would have, but Francis wouldn't have had. But he's a great preacher. Do you keep him or not? 
you tend to keep it. See? And that's, that's how... Uh, that's how the cutting edge of, of the saints who established our religious orders is generally kind of whittled down. Uh, but they do a great deal to the, reform the church at their peak. And then they have, they have great ministries afterwards, not as dramatic, but, but they sustain great ministries. Franciscans have been around for about eight centuries now, and they've done a tremendous amount of good work. Uh, the other saint who st established an order that helped profound the church was St. Dominic. Now, Dominic was like Francis in the sense of being uh, dedicated to poverty, but his approach was different. He wanted his followers to be excellent preachers, and he wanted them to be well-educated. <coughs> and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Albert the Great, for example, were Dominicans a different way of living out Jesus' gospel. But those two orders in the 13th century had a profound impact, shaping up the church, preaching to the people, challenging the hierarchy, reforming the church uh, from within. Now, here's something about the Catholic Church different from Protestantism that I didn't realize for, uh, for a long time. I was a priest before I realized this. It's one of the fundamental differences between how Catholicism and Protestantism exist as, as organizations or whatever word you want to pick. In Protestantism and in Catholicism both, you have people who want to live out the basic values of Jesus Christ. In any Christian group, you find those dedicated souls who are close to God, close to Christ. In Catholicism, they start religious orders or they start movements, and they stay within the church, reforming the whole church, kind of like Francis. He started with a group of companions, they grew, went to the Pope, became a religious order. They had a tremendous impact. In Protestantism, that same desire to live closer to Christ leads generally to the formation of new churches. So that every Protestant church, pretty much, began with a great person, like, for example, John Wesley, a great preacher, a charismatic person, a saint. But it led to Methodism, which was a reform of Anglicanism, which was a reform of Catholicism, you see? And so now the Anglicans, they want to be reformed, and the Methodists want to be reformed, and since others, others have broken off, broken off from the Methodists. Um, so you see the difference there, huh? The Catholic Church believes that we always someplace need to be reformed and that that can be done within. And what tends to happen in Protestantism, not always, but it tends to happen, is that new churches get established as a result of a f reform movement rather than the church, whatever it is, getting renewed. And... Uh, and that's part of the reason that, that through the centuries the Catholic Church has these forces of vitality rise up within it. But because we stay together, try to renew the whole group. For example, let me give you an, an example that really struck me. <coughs> I especially liked uh, uh, Reverend Ed Briggs, who's the Baptist minister down the street from where I was in Silver Spring. And uh, one day he said to me, do you have any of those Pentecostal-type people over there in your church? And I said, oh, yeah, we have a charismatic prayer group that meets on Thursday nights. He said, we wouldn't allow that. If they want to be charismatic, they have to go to a charismatic church. So you see, it's that idea of Catholic means all-inclusive, religious orders, movements, that functions within the one umbrella of the Catholic Church, whereas in Protestantism, it tends to be 
kind of divided up. One church being a reform of another, being a reform of another, and uh, different movements sometimes having to step outside and form their own church. Sometimes, not always. But we have about 2,000 different kinds of Protestant churches in America today. It's a lot of, of splitting up. Is, is anyone have any comments on that? Does that make sense? Do you have any questions about that? You know what I'm trying to say? Is we believe in staying together and reforming the whole church. Yeah, Carol. Liberation theology. Mm -hmm. Well, those people, a lot of those people live under repressive governments. And their theologians have, have come up with a, a systematic understanding of the gospel which centers on, on the freedom, the liberation of people, that, that salvation involves some kind of earthly liberation and that Jesus himself confronted authority structure when he was alive, and that Christians have to be willing to do the same thing today. You know, Jesus confronted the authority structure with his understanding of the word of God. You know, threw the thieves out of the temple, he was crucified, because Jesus was confrontative. And that when we face injustice, something that, that is a systematic denial of God's will in the lives of people, we need to confront that too, to free people up. And that basic insight is articulated in liberation theology. It's having a powerful impact in parts of the world where Christians are living under oppressive or unjust regimes. And uh, because they are a little bit more sympathetic to Marxism than we would be in this country. The Vatican has been very suspicious of liberation theology. But a couple weeks ago, the Vatican issued a document that they sort of have uh, come to an understanding about it. The main concern of the Vatican is they don't want Christians entering into alliances, especially armed alliances, with communists. That's a, another sign of a kind of vitality. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, just to skip over some vast periods in history, uh, in the Middle Ages you had the Crusades. It became a passion for Christians to rescue the Holy Land from, from, from non-Christians. Even St. Francis uh, went to the Holy Land to try to convert one of the sultans. And uh, so it, it was, they weren't bad people, but for some reason the, the church got very uh, militaristic, promoting crusades, and it was a rather poor time. That was followed in the mid-15th century to the 16th century by the Renaissance, the rediscovery of pagan literature and <coughs> pagan statues and pagan culture. And, and uh, taking the best of a lot of that into uh, Western and Christian civilization. But we find that in the Renaissance, again, the church was in a situation where the church needed to be reformed. You had things like all kinds of popes with illegitimate children, too much concern for wealth, all those same kinds of things as you run across in the 13th century. And the church eventually did get reformed, but what happened is what we call the Reformation. Martin Luther was an Augustinian priest. You know Mary Menashe's brother, Father Cleary? That's the same religious community, the Augustinians, that produced Martin Luther. Even today, they're reluctant, I understand, to publish. They feel they got <laughs> badly burned with one of their early authors. So uh, Luther was a, was a devout person. And he lived at a time when, when much of the church was just plain old corrupt, clearly needed reform, clearly needed to be called back to the gospel. And 
that's what Luther tried to do. Luther did not set out to split off from the church, but to reform the church. And um, Luther found a solution to his own religious needs in St. Paul's epistle to the Romans. I, I got the, did anyone have a Bible here? Good, thanks a lot. Luther was a man very much torn um, by, his, by his desire to please God and yet aware of his own sinfulness. And in meditating on the book of Romans, Martin Luther found a solution to that. And uh, this is the fourth chapter of the book of Romans. It's talking about Abraham's trust in God. Abraham never questioned or doubted God's promise. Rather, he was strengthened in faith and gave glory to God, fully persuaded that God could do whatever he had promised. Thus, his faith was credited to him as justice. The words, it was credited to him, were not written with him alone in view. They were intended for us too. For our faith will be credited to us also if we believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So in other words, Martin Luther saw in this powerful message of Jesus' salvation, that salvation did not depend upon our innate goodness, but that the justification is a gift from God to, that God gives to those who have faith in Jesus Christ. And I would say that all of the scriptures in classical Protestantism are seen through the lens of this passage and the book of Romans. And obviously, uh, there's immense truth in there. But what happens when people get into an argument, which is what happened, is that everything starts to get said so as to maximize the differences between people, which is what happened in the Reformation. The theologians of today have gone over and looked over the documents and, and found that there, that there wasn't anywhere near the amount of real disagreement as people in that day thought that there was. But every, every disagreement, every difference was exaggerated to maximize the differences because re different religious camps, they started to just be at war with each other. And you know, that the war doesn't continue today, but you still find in the Catholic faith, in various Protestant faith, people who want to state their faith in such a way as to maximize their differences with other people. It's so sad, you see. And, and when you really sit down and think about it and talk to, the, talk to people, you realize a lot of people are arguing about words. For example, I'm saved by faith, or I'm saved by Jesus. Okay. You'd be amazed how people could argue about that and consider that to be a basic difference. You know? <coughs> or um, for example, Romans clearly says salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. If you look in Matthew's Gospel at the scene of the Last Supper, not the Last Supper, but the Last Judgment, Jesus is painting a picture of the Last Judgment. And what does Jesus say? I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. Well, that's not opposed to, to salvation by faith. But what Jesus is really saying is, that there's love there, huh? Okay, it's a love of faith-filled people, huh? Well, you could, you could say, oh, it, it makes sense. There's no reason disagreeing about that, you know? Love is the greatest commandment. 
But then if you read it all through Romans, you can say, ah, but only the faith-filled person is capable of love. You see, they get involved in all of these, what to me are word games, Catholics as well as Protestants, exaggerating our differences. Uh, classically, Luther took certain choices, and he can be read in such a way that he's disagreeing with the Catholic Church all the time. It's not, not how the best of scholars try to read him today, but there are three phrases that came to summarize Luther's approach to Christianity. Sola Scriptura, which means only the scripture, not any tradition. Sola Gratia, salvation is a pure gift from God. There's no merit of your own that enters into the picture. And sola fidei, salvation is simply through faith. Good works do not count for anything in terms of, of one's justification. Well, those became rallying cries. If it were today, those would be on the banners, you see. And they tend to be a certain way of reading the scripture. Uh, now, I, I studied under uh, Harry McSorley, a, uh, a well-known theologian who got his doctorate studying Martin Luther's uh, theory of justification by faith, comparing it with, with Catholic theory. And he's written a book on it called Luther, Right or Wrong. And what he concluded is that when you boil it all down, there really is no, no difference between those positions. That, that when you read all of Luther, uh, th there is precious little uh, disagreement with Catholic theology. But in that age, there, it seemed like a chasm separating the two. And the Catholics did the same thing. At the Council of Trent, they characterized Protestant positions in such a way as to maximize the differences. And then they anathematized people who held these characterizations of Protestant belief. How sad, you see. It's when, it's when, 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 when people kind of get their religious passions aroused and say, I have it. And they stop trying to understand what the other person is saying. Well, um, as you know, the, the Reformation uh, spread. It was helped by the forces of nationalism, uh, but there was also a sincerely religious movement to return to Christ. But what it led to was the disintegration of Christianity in the West as we knew it. it used to be one church oftentimes in need of reform, always in need of reform someplace. We still are. Uh, now it became <coughs> tremendously divided up. Uh, and, and the word, like, names of John Calvin, uh, Henry VIII, uh, uh, John Knox, they were all reformers in different countries. And they all led vast chunks of the people out of the Catholic Church. And that process has continued. Uh, w once the unity is broken, and you take just the scriptures as your guide, then you can read it to maximize differences with other people whenever other forces around you lead you to do that. So I had a, I had a luncheon at the rectory, and I, there were three ministers there. Friends of mine, people I really care about. <coughs> And uh, one of them said, and this embarrassed me, he said, well, my church is simply the most biblical church to which a person can belong. And sitting right there was the pastor of Grace Brethren, who I, I know is totally biblical in his approach. What do they mean when they say that? He says, my reading of the scripture is more accurate than your reading of the scripture. That's tr that has turned Christianity into a Tower of Babel. And uh, it, it would take divine intervention over quite a period of time 
to bring Christianity back together again. But what I hope is characteristic of enlightened Catholics is that we don't read the scriptures to maximize differences with other people. We are an inclusive church. There's room for a lot of different ways of living out the Christian faith uh, within the Catholic Church, different spiritualities, different movements. Uh, we should be the most tolerant of the churches in terms of helping people live their religious lives as it seems as though the Holy Spirit wants them to do it. The One of the mechanisms of the Catholic Church's reform was calling a council. We, we saw before reform through formation of religious communities. Then the council. The council was the Council of Trent. Trent was a little town, I think it was in Italy. That council was called by Pope Paul III 25 years after Luther broke with the church. I wonder why it took them so long. Part, partly it was because they needed reform so much. <laughs> People don't like to reform themselves. And then they had the hardest time getting that council started. The Pope announced the day it was going to start, and he sent three representatives, and when they got there, there was no one there. What an inauspicious beginning for the reformation of the Catholic Church from within. Um, the French king didn't want any French bishops to go. The Spanish king wanted the, the church to be reformed. Later on, for other reasons, they got into a war, so that when the council did start, it had to be delayed for three more years. Um, eventually, in December 13, 1545, in Trent, 31 bishops and 48 theologians gathered. And then membership in the Council of Trent, the number of bishops who would come, varied from, 30, from 32 to 228. But what they did was they had a tremendous impact on the church. They reformed the liturgy as best they could. They shaped up the moral lives of priests. They cut out a lot of abuses. They, they gave guidelines for teaching the church. They invited uh, the uh, Protestants, who by that time were not interested in going to a council with, with uh, Catholics anymore. Um, and, and so the Council of Trent reformed the Catholic Church. If you were born Catholic, you were born in the church that was shaped by the Council of Trent uh, three and four centuries ago. And do you know what it's like when people are at war? People who lived through World War II will tell you about it. You mailed a letter, the government could read it. The amount of food you got and the kinds of food were controlled by ration booklets. Your gasoline was rationed. And when people are at war, they take all those things and they're faithful to them because they realize the survival of the nation is at stake. Well. The Council of Trent was that kind of a council. The Catholic Church was at war with Protestants for its survival. And that's how the, a lot of the uptightness entered the Catholic Church. The concentration on rules, the concentration on, on obedience, because they were fighting for their survival. And you know, a lot of Catholics like that. I wish we could go back to that, because it conveyed a real sense of identity. You know, the bishop said something and everybody did it. That's the Tridentine Church, the church which was fighting the Protestants. People obeyed it for that reason. It's not the spirit of Catholic Christianity generally. And uh, Pope John the Twenty-Third called the Second Vatican Council, and that ended the Tridentine period in the Church's history. The centuries in which we were at war with Protestants ended, and what came is an age in which we realized that Protestants are our sisters and brothers, fellow Christians, <coughs> and that somehow in God's plan we pray that all those who, who accept Jesus and have faith in him will be able to speak to this world with one voice 
and in, and in brotherhood and in sisterhood again. Kind of recreating a unity and replacing unity with, uh, and doing away with the, the uh, competition, replacing it with unity. One of the reformers in that Tridentine time was St. Ignatius Loyola. He founded the Jesuits. He was a Spanish soldier. He got wounded in war. And in that wounding, he, uh, he had a tremendous conversion experience. He could only <laughs> lay there in bed. But he had, he had the Gospels to read, and it changed his whole life. And uh, in founding the Jesuits, they were very instrumental. Like Francis was in the 13th century, the Jesuits were reforming the church, preaching to the people, uh, challenging the church leadership in terms of gospel values. It would have been great if Martin Luther had been, like Ignatius Loyola, reforming the church from within. But Luther pretty much met a blank wall in trying to reform the church from within. and. Uh, <coughs> Um, and he was desperate to uh, bring to the people the Gospels. There's, more, there's plenty of sin on both sides, plenty of right and wrong on both sides of the Reformation. Uh, and now our job is to repair it. And that's, that's the stage of the church's life today. And some churches are very interested in, in reunion and and others are not particularly. But Catholics believe that reunion, unity of Christians, is part of the will of Christ. Are there any questions on what I've just said? Gloria. Um, when you were just first talking about the Reformation, you said it's really crazy that we put the ban on the Protestant <coughs> religions to hold the ban. Some. But that really seems to be different. To only scripture, only grace, uh, only faith. <coughs> Well, you find a great differences among Protestants. Um, but I would say that, that Lutherans who are in a fairly strict Lutheran tradition still find those to be the starting points of their theology. Well, it's only scripture. You don't need someone to interpret it for you. you don't. OK. It's salvation comes only by God's grace, you don't, you don't merit it, okay? Um, and it's only by faith, not by any, any works that you do. So why do you? Well, um, uh, um, Well, you have to try to try your best to to live up to the gospels, but maybe you have a better answer to that. <laughs> I have found that once you know Christ and you really embrace Christ, you can't help but love Christ. Right. You, you depend on Christ for your salvation, but love leads you to want to live your life as, as Jesus lived his. So it kind of comes back in a way. Um, and Catholics don't disagree with that. Now, if they, if they were capable of having that kind of understanding in the 16th century, if they were capable of sitting down and talking things out, if they were morally upright enough to be able to do that, you wouldn't have had all that religious conflict. They've done it since, but it's kind of like <laughs> talking after the, after the milk is spilled and the cow is out of the barn and everything else. <coughs> Georgia. This uh, type of Catholicism existed all the way up until the time of John the 23rd. Because as I was growing up in the 40s and 50s, the rules in the Catholic Church were very strict about associating with Protestants. Mm -hmm. We weren't even allowed to go to the Protestant Church at all. Right. We weren't allowed to go for weddings. And uh, yeah. so 
we who grew up in the Catholic Church and say went to Catholic schools in the 50s know, you know, this actually existed all the way up until the time of John the 23rd, and he was a magnificent pope. He really changed the Catholic Church. Right. And, and some Catholics think that friendship with Protestants and respect for Protestant faith is a threat to our identity. Actually, it's an affirmation of our identity, you know, and it's, it, it's a statement of confidence that we can, we can help each other to be reformed according to the mind of Christ. We're not enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil are the enemies, not other Christians. And the world understood not as the natural planet, but as, as what's under the domain of sin. <coughs> Anything else? Rosemary. Is how do you know how do the, how do councils reach their decisions? Well, that's a whole process of conversion in itself. I mean, they get there uh, together, they study the scriptures, they ha they have theologians there, they look at the past teaching of the church, uh, the prophets of the church kind of show up who have, who have helped create the possibility of a council through movements, through new religious communities, and all. And it all kind of comes together. And, and th yeah, they do. They vote on, on matters. But they arrive there with mindsets that come from the world that they're in. And then they're exposed to the problems of the whole church and the thinking of the whole church. And it's a very creative environment. And if you look at the documents of the Second Vatican Council, you find it just filled with scriptures on every page. And yet, there's tradition there, too, as the church continues. One of the things that happened in the warfare stage between us and Protestants that you still find is taking isolated scripture quotes and throwing them at the other person. That's intellectually disrespect disrespectful. I mean, it's, it's just penny-ante kind of stuff. No, that hasn't proved anything to anybody for centuries, and people still do that, you know? So you can, you can take out of 1 or 2 Thessalonians of Paul's statement, you know, respect the traditions which have been handed down. Or you can take Romans and justification by faith. Or you can take James about good works and oppose that to Romans. You can do that stuff forever. It, it, just, it, just, it just babbles. No, there's nothing from the Second Vatican Council that was infallible. That's not normal teaching of the church. The, the council was just restating Christian beliefs, and it was, uh, it, was, it was ordinary teaching of the church. And much truer to our traditions because of it. Well... We often I just want to spend a little bit of time on uh, the presentation that we make two weeks from now, right? Um, about a half an hour. Do you have any thoughts on it, Ralph?